How is everybody doing this morning? Good. Fantastic. Good, good. Good to see you. Awesome. Right. Awesome. Good to see everybody. Um, so anything to talk about before we get started? Anybody have any quick questions before we get started? Um, any questions on uh, anything that's going on? I want to tell you guys a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Um, Ayana has been, if you haven't been getting responses from Ayana, she has been in the hospital for the last uh, couple of days. Um, she has a, a condition that comes up from time to time. And so she's been in the hospital. She's supposed to get out this morning. Um, so if she hasn't been responding, you can direct questions to me. In the meantime, I'll do the best that I can. Um, and uh, Abby has been sick as well. So uh, it's just been, it's just been uh, me for the most part holding this down. Um, and we're actually supposed to be, we are training a new person as well. Um, so we're, uh, we're growing and expanding and uh, going through some problems right now, just uh, personnel wise with some illnesses. So, um, so bear with us on, on stuff that's going on in the office right now. Um, and, uh, and we'll all give our best wishes for them to get better soon and feel good. Um, in the meantime, let's talk about um, building. You got clients right now. And it is, uh, it is difficult to find them places to live right now. So as you guys have, have discovered, taking them out and looking for places and putting in offers and, and getting rejected and, and not being able to, uh, to get the highest and best and doing all that kind of stuff. And so they are, as we talked about last week, they are wandering into new home builders. Um, and a lot of them are becoming interested in building on their own lots. Um, and so I want to go through that process with you. This is something I get questions about all the time. Um, you know, the whole, just understanding the whole process because it's not a cookie cutter type, let's put in an offer and close a deal. So let's talk about that. You have a, uh, you have a client who is considering this option. So what do you do? You would obviously look for a lot, uh, you know, talk to them about where they want to live and all that kind of stuff. A lot of times they'll find a lot on their own. They'll, they'll kind of have an idea where they want to live and they'll find a lot. Um, so what do you do? What is the process? Um, the first thing you're going to do is secure the lot. You're going to use a vacant land contract for that. Um, everybody have questions about the vacant land contract? Has everyone done one? Does anyone like to see one? Now is when you can unmute and say whatever you want. Ryan, I'd like to see one. Rich. Okay. Well, that's what I was uh, doing here. So let's go to this. Yeah. All right. So this is a vacant land contract. It is entitled vacant land contract. It'll be available on your, um, on your form simplicity or your transaction desk or whatever you're using. Um, vacant land contract. Now I have, this is, there you go. Okay. Seller, buyer, Property address, price. You guys pipe up if you have any questions as we're going along. Price, here's where you'd have the agent's name and uh, the escrow agent and all that stuff. Um, so in vacant land, there are a couple of different kinds of reasons people buy vacant land. Uh, for a residential vacant land like this, uh, typically they're just one deposit. A lot of times with commercial or with bigger deals, if this is a million here, you'll see a lot of times that this will be 25,000 and then they'll do another 25,000 after their feasibility period, which will be right here. Um, but we'll talk about that and we'll talk about feasibility period in a second as well. So, but with a vacant land for residential build, typically there's just one deposit made at contract within three days. Um, uh, typically you're gonna see uh, 70 to 75% loan to value. That can change based on credit doesn't go usually any better than that, but it can be worse, bad credit. They might only do 65% or something like that. Um, okay, also with, with vacant land, well, I'll get that later. Let's go through the contract. Okay, um, time of accept acceptance, typical, just like you would with anything else, give them a couple of days. Transaction will close on, you wanna make this a couple of months out, typically. Um, you, they can close a vacant loan a vacant land loan very, very easily and quickly usually. But uh, you want to give yourself time for a feasibility study before you spend too much time on, or sorry, before you spend too much money and time on getting the loan closed. So give yourself at least 60 days. And I'm talking about a typical uh, vacant land that is 
uh, has houses around it, maybe, you know, at least down the street, if not next door. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that during the feasibility study as well. So the contract will close on that date. That's two months roughly. Okay. This contract is contingent on this one. A lot of people buy cash. A lot, a lot of times people are buying, you know, $30,000 lots and $50,000 lots. And so they're just going to pay cash. Um, you get over a hundred and people start typically financing it. Um, and we'll talk about how all that in, ties in with the financing with the construction perm loan as well. Uh, which is going to be a new term for a lot of you guys, but that's um, what takes over when you want to start building. So this is just a vacant lot loan, the vacant lot contract, and then we're going to do a vacant lot loan um, with this contract. Okay, um, uh, same thing, the 30 days financing period, the five days uh, to apply for financing, new financing, 70%, and I'm just doing this, you can get 75%, uh, you know, but I'm just throwing this out there. Um, this is just a, this is obviously a fake one. It was Tom Brady buying this lot. Um, assignability. Uh, I like to do this. You can do whatever you like, may assign and thereby be released. Uh, a lot of people don't like that. I wouldn't like that as a seller. That means you can just back out anytime, assign it to, you know, Harvey the rabbit. Um, may assign, but not be released from liability under contract. I like that. And here's why. A lot of you guys are turning in these that says may not assign this contract. We recently had, I, I had one of you guys uh, the other day, they're working, they're buying um, for a girl, a girl and her boyfriend were the clients and they were buying from a lady uh, who was a little bit off her rocker. So they're buying this house and now the lender says, oh, your boyfriend has to be on the loan as well. So I want him on the contract. They went back to the lady and the lady said, no, I don't agree. I've never met this guy. I don't, I don't understand this. Uh, I want an extra $3,000. So just do this one may assign but not be released from liability on this contract. If someone has to be added or dropped from this contract, it can be assigned without the seller's permission. Okay, so, and, and even as a seller's agent, I don't really care here, that's fine. Uh, they can't be released from liability. So whoever originally signed the contract is still liable for the escrow. Um, I mean, that's all they can be held liable for. So um, I like this and I don't mind it on the other side. I like to ask for that. Um, let's go evidence, ask for a title insurance commitment, not an abstract of title. Those are not really seen much anymore. Uh, title examination, feasibility study. This is what I want to see. So, um, I'm actually buying a lot and building myself right now. So this is a, a near and dear subject to my heart. Um, when doing investigation, of this lot, I saw a conservation easement that was taking up way more of the property than I wanted. And I would have had to build at the very front of the property. Um, this is a lot that's on the lake. I want to build a little closer to the lake than what they had me doing because I wouldn't be able to see it because of the trees and everything else. So uh, we are, uh, we've already closed on the lot now, but we went through our feasibility study to make sure that we could adjust that conservation easement and the setback from it. So uh, once we got comfortable with that, we were ready to close. But this is in a neighborhood that has houses next to it. If you're building in a, in a, a rural, a lot of these are going to be in rural areas and stuff like that, maybe near lakes and stuff like that. So there might be wetlands that take up a lot of this land. There might be a lot of mitigation expenses and stuff like that to even get a buildable pad on this property. So you want to make sure, take this time and, and, and don't, you don't have to do all the work. Make sure the client does the work as well um, to make sure that they're going to get what they want. And you really want the client to do the work because you want them to be the ultimate judge of making sure they get what they want. So you don't have the liability here where it looks like you forced them into buying this lot. Or, did you have you to get that? a variance from the, uh, Ryan, did you have to get a variance from the town to be able to move the house back? I, I, I would, I would have Bob, but I, it, I, I am working with an environmental company who does the mitigation. And I realized in the meantime that I don't have to, I don't have to, uh, I don't have to negotiate with the town or try to get a variance on their 50 foot setback. So because I can eat up enough of that concert, I don't want to build 50 feet from the lake anyway. So I can, I can build, I can eat up enough of that. So, so yes, you're, you're right. In a normal circumstance, if I only wanted to, to, to go down 25 feet of that 50 feet and go through a variance with the town, I would have, uh, I would have made my contract contingent on that, or I would have asked for more time to get that. So you can absolutely, and this additional terms when we get to the bottom is where you make it contingent on this or contingent on that. Um, that's where as a developer in my previous life, we would buy a lot of extra time by making things contingent on 
uh, the, the city, uh, city or county approvals, um, the PUD site plan approval, all that kind of stuff. You can make it contingent on any kind of approval. And sometimes that takes six months. So that blows right through your, um, you can have all of the closing date that you want to have on here. So a lot of times in commercial, if you're doing a commercial piece that you're going to, that you're going to end up developing, you'll make it contingent on that, but you'll put your closing as 30 days after uh, 30 days, even 15 days after feasibility study expiration. And then at the bottom, you'll say feasibility study does not expire until we have these permits or these uh, approvals. Okay. So that's a great question because a lot of times you do have to get, uh, the buyers do want to get that. And so now if you did it this way, see mine was in a, mine was in a neighborhood, so I didn't really worry about it that way. But if you're doing it, um, if you have certain setbacks or certain things that you're going to have to negotiate, it's good to say um, you have to get all that ironed out during your feasibility study. Otherwise, you're stuck with this lot the way it is, maybe. Or you can take the chance that you can get it fixed later. So you don't want to do that. So during the feasibility study, it's just like the as is inspection, uh, inspection period. Um, you can back out for any reason that you don't feel it says here. Any buyer, buyer can back, buyer is, if buyer is not satisfied, they can back out. So during that same time, it's the same as the inspection period. Okay, um, and a lot of the stuff, the same, this paragraph reads very similar, except just substituting some words in and out. Buyer will at buyer's own expense perform their feasibility. They can get a phase one, they can do whatever. Seller should not unreasonably withhold access to the property. Um, the same as anything else. It's a lot easier because you don't have to work with a seller and a, and a tenant or a seller um, owner occupied house and stuff like that. So, um, so before expiration of feasibility steer, uh, study period, buyer must deliver written notice to seller of buyer's determination whether or not the property is acceptable. Okay. If you don't, it's assumed that it is just like with, with our inspection period. If you don't let them know, then it's assumed that we're going forward and your, and your deposit is at risk after that. Okay. Um, closing costs, all this stuff is boilerplate stuff. Read through it, but it's all boilerplate stuff. Um, and then at the bottom, you, this is how you fill out your uh, commission stuff like you normally do. And then additional terms. This is where you put feasibility study will not expire until buyer is satisfied they have uh, approvals for this or that. Okay. This is where you put that there. And if you need help with this stuff while you're doing it, you can give me a call for the, for the wording. It's not, it's not super legal stuff. It's been used on everything. Um, any questions on that? All right, so we got a little bit into the feasibility period. So hold on a second, I'm trying to. Ryan, one question. Um, yes. You said you hire an environmental group. Is that normally what you would do? Uh, not if you're, only if you have issues. So um, the survey will show the, you, you, all right, so there's a process, okay? Um, you only do if you only if you have environmental issues like this one had a, a big construction easement across two thirds of it. It's an acre property, but it had two thirds of it had a construction easement across it. Okay, um, that the that the original developer had negotiated with St. John's River Water Management District, etc. So um, there's all kinds of, of stuff like this. So you want to make sure that the pad that's what you do during that 30 days is you go to the local jurisdiction and make sure that you can build where you want and the footprint that you want on this lot. Okay. So that's what that's what you do during that time, and only if you have an environmental problem do you hire the environmental uh, assessment. You can get a phase one and, and that kind of stuff. But again, in a neighborhood like this one is in a neighborhood, I knew there weren't environmental issues with the property. Um, you just want to make sure that you can build the the pad that you want on the lot where you want to put it, and you can and you can situate it a certain way and all that kind of stuff. You know, different buyers have different needs for that. So yeah, environmental is part of your feasibility study. Um, and certainly if you're gonna do commercial, um, industrial, especially stuff like that, if it used to be, um, a lot of properties are, are tainted by previous uses, uh, storing trucks and stuff, the oil leaks down into the soil and that becomes an environmental issue and stuff as well. So you wanna get soil borings and all that kind of stuff. Typically, if it's a big money deal, yes. If you're building a house, you just wanna make sure you can build the pad you can build the footprint that you want on the pad that you want situated the way that you want on the property. Okay. If you guys do a poor job of this, you can be, uh, there's some liability involved in that. If you're just peddling off this property, telling your buyer, Oh, it's fine. You can build exactly what you want, how you want. 
and you don't actually help them do the research for it. And again, you want them to do it. Don't you're, you're not going to kill yourself for a $30,000 lot sale. You want them to do the work and because you want them to be satisfied for it as well. Okay. So, um, so Ryan, if I'm selling a $30,000 lot, why should I even bother? You can also go to the home builder and get a commission on selling it. So you introduce them to home builders. So you want to meet some home builders, some people who do custom homes. And, and most of these people, this isn't typically a, a, a poor man's game. Um, Bob, for example, sells a lot of lots down in Point Sienna area, but he sells them to builders who are going to build lots. That's uh, They're buying uh, less expensive lots, but they're going to build houses and sell them, whether they're building spec houses or they have customers already, whatever they're doing. Um, but typically you know, these lots that are $100,000, $200,000, stuff like that, which is what you're going to see a lot of. Those are people who can buy a lot and still have their old house, get approved for two houses at once and that kind of thing. Um, not as it's not quite like the selling a new construction home. Um, typically, these are going to be people who can do this stuff. And so they're going to be people who can also figure out what they want to build and how they want to build it. So the next thing they have to do is you want to introduce them to a builder and get a commission from the builder. You can absolutely do that. I get that question a lot. So Ryan, I'm selling this hundred thousand dollar lot. Is that all I can make? I had a, I had a five hundred thousand dollar home buyer, and now all I'm going to make is a hundred thousand because I'm selling a lot. No, find them a builder, introduce them, and do it that way. Are Ryan. you? Uh, is everybody hearing me? Um, Ryan. Am I cutting? Am I cutting out? I can no, hear you. Sound good. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, Martha Laney, you raised your hand. Yes, Ryan. Thank you. I am looking for a vacant land that um, my client wants to build uh, a house, but uh, with a container home. Do you have any experience of that? What counties is easy to do uh, a container home? Um, I don't, I don't have any experience. You talk about like a tiny home, like a, the con, in like tiny, the, small, but what, do a, what do you mean a container home? Like container, like a, for the boat. You know, like a train, like a train container type thing. Like a train car. Metal, yeah. You know, those metal containers. I don't have any idea, shipping, but I'm sure shipping yeah. containers from, from the right. dock. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen these. So they are, they're like the size of a tiny home and they're like, they're, they're small, but I understand the container. Uh, I don't zoning, have any it? zoning and stuff like that. It's a manufactured uh, home by all tests. It's like a prefab. Something without an HOA. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this typically, typically in rural counties, those are more acceptable. Those kinds of things were the same kind of place where you could put a mobile home and that kind of stuff. So, uh, I, but I don't know. Um, I really don't. So uh, I'll be happy to talk to you about it later if you want. Typically that. Um, so let me get let me go on with this. So you'll find for, so you find a builder, and you will work out the contract with them and you know whatever they built. So yes, you still sell that five hundred thousand dollar house. They're just going to build. They're going to spend a hundred on the lot, and and four hundred on building their house. Okay. So. So you still you still make a good commission on this, but it is yes, it's a lot more work, and yes, it takes a lot more time. But it is it is a sale and it is real estate and you um, do that. Well, Dalton says a lot of builders pay commission up front too. So we'll see about that. So see if you can work that out. So here's how it works. So you buy the lot. Now what? You've got you've got they've got to get a plan. They're going to work with the builder. The builder's going to help them through all that process. The builder gets approved. So now they need to find a construction perm loan. So few lenders. I don't know what percentage percentage of them, and we know some. If I can, if you need some help, a few lenders do vacant vacant uh, lot loans. Not everyone does them. Um, Seacoast Bank does them. Iberia Bank does them. Um, I did mine through Iberia. Uh, it was a great process. Very simple. Um, a lot of people, uh, a, a lot of banks, a lot of lenders do them, but not not most of them don't. So then, from that point you'll go to a traditional lender and get the what's called a construction perm. So they fund the construction on a draw schedule. The builder goes in and 
They'll get a little bit when they when they level the land, and they'll get a little bit more when they pour the slab. How many ever? Some some lenders will do as many as twenty draws, and some people will only some lenders will only do five. Builders like twenty draws. They like to get a little bit as they go along. So um, work with each one of those on there. Your lot just so, just so you have uh, so you can guide your clients through this. Their lot lender is going to tell them five six percent, maybe more depending on their credit. But good credit gets you five percent on the lot. The good news is as soon as they start building, it's going to, they're going to uh, transition to construction perm. Construction perm is still more, you're not going to get your 2.75 in that, you're going to get your 3.25 or 3% or something like that as you go through the construction process. The good news is they only pay interest on whatever's been given out. So if they've only paid, if the lender's only paid out 30,000 for the slab to be poured, they're only paying interest on 30,000. Okay. So um, and, and then the, the plus the plus the lot whatever the lot loan was and yes you can still build at um, you know five percent ten percent whatever it is that you want um, uh, down so it's not that cash intensive okay so yeah you put twenty five percent down for the lot say you bought that hundred thousand dollar lot and you put twenty five thousand down well you can still build a five hundred thousand dollar house without putting more cash in it because that could be five percent down on five hundred thousand. Okay, does everybody understand that? Does anybody have any questions? I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna go through. Uh, Ryan, I, I do. The, the, yeah, go ahead, Mel. the construction loans, um, the person has to pay interest only on till the house is closed and that construction loan turns into a mortgage loan? Okay, so yeah, it's construction to permanent financing. No, not interest only, you're only paying the interest on the, um, on the part that they've spent. So, so when, I, when I get my construction loan, which I don't have yet, because I haven't, I'm still looking at plans and stuff like that. So I haven't, I haven't gotten my construction permit. I know what I'm gonna do. But right now my builder is being approved by the lender and we're going over plans. So when they start building, my construction perm lender will buy Iberia Bank out of theirs. They'll pay off Iberia Bank, right? And so then I will start and they'll start paying the builder draws as he starts doing work. And as he does work, they'll send an inspector. There's a draw inspector who goes out and makes sure, yep, slab got poured today, you know, release some money to him, whatever the, that amount is, whatever that percentage is. And they'll release that percentage. When they release that percentage to the builder, now I have my original loan of Iberia Bank that I've been that that this new lender has taken over, and I'm paying them for now. So let's say that's a hundred thousand dollars now, plus the thirty thousand they gave the builder for pouring the slab. So now my lot total, my total loan is one hundred thirty thousand that I'm paying on. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks from now, when they give them another thirty thousand, now I've got one hundred sixty thousand that I'm paying on. So I'm saying if my total loan is 500,000, I'm not paying on 500,000 the whole time, only paying on what they've okay. actually given out. Now, when it's all over, they'll convert it to a permanent loan and I'll pay the whole, my regular loan payment, right? And they'll escrow for HOAs and they'll do all that kind of stuff as well. Okay. Does everybody okay, understand thank that? You, you bet. Um, so, oh, so when they're doing this, how do they decide that they're gonna approve you for this? So what they do is they take your plans and they do an as-built appraisal. So they'll take your plans, they'll put them on that lot, and they'll say, when it gets done, this house is going to be worth 550000 So sure, we'll loan 500000 on it. Everybody got that? Does that make sense? So it's an imaginary appraisal on the house when it's built, called an as-built appraisal, where they'll say, when this house is built to so these plans on that lot, it should be worth 550000 So sure, we'll loan the 500000 no problem or it should be worth 500,000 as long as it appraises just like anything else, they'll loan the money on it. Okay. Um, yeah, I know a few builders, you guys, I've met several recently. Um, I got uh, three or four um, uh, bids on my house. I mean, I've, I've met some, some are very expensive and some are very um, any less expensive. They're not, not inexpensive, but they're less expensive. Um, so this is a, uh, uh, you know, good and legitimate. Uh, well, they'll all have a book of business. They'll all have, they'll be able to share with you 
properties that they've done before. So look for those on there. Um, should your client start with architectural designs or lot shopping? You can do both at once. Um, that's what we did. We've been looking at plans this whole time. Um, but I think it's best to find the lot to decide what you want to do. Um, so I would say, I would say lot shopping first, and then you kind of figure out what you want. For example, the lot that we ended up with is sloped down to the lake. So we had never considered doing a walkout basement type model before, but then we considered doing it. We're going to end up not doing it, but because of the, the slope of the lot, we almost had to change the design. And a lot of times a builder will make you change the design and say, this is this would work better here. Um, you know, this this way I don't have to bring in 50 truckloads of dirt, I only have to bring in 20 truckloads of dirt, which saves you $300 a trip on that. You know, so that kind of thing. Um, so that's a great question. I am. Um, this is Shirley, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I have a lot, it's a, it's a ski lake water from that. It's about one acre. And uh, I'm thinking, um, since I'm an investor side, I'm thinking what should I do to make this uh, valuable? Um, so I, uh, it's a raw land. And some people said, if I do, I'm thinking, should I build it? Should I get a, a buildable, uh, uh, buildable ready for build? that lot. So I, uh, some people say, first of all, you might get a survey or some people say you might get a appraisal. Some people say you might get an environment study. Um, so uh, which way should I go if that's you? Okay, so so you own, let me get this, this story right. You own the lot and you are thinking of selling it. Yes. Um, I, I would have to sit down with you and, and look at the lot. It depends on what it is. Lots, okay, lots are the least liquid of real estate, right? There aren't many, even though we're sitting here talking about this, there aren't a whole lot of people out there buying lots. There are some. Like I said before, it's not a, uh, it's not a, not a game everybody can play, okay? So especially you're talking about a ski, ski lake front lot, right? Is that what you yeah. said? The ski yeah. lake, you have a lakefront lot. Maybe that lot's worth a cut. Where is the lot located? I in Winter Heaven. Is uh, I don't have a wetland. Okay, okay. So you to find out what the property is worth, I would spend a little bit of money. I, not an appraisal. Not an appraisal. So mm -hmm. typically, what what just so you guys know, when you're doing when you're doing like residential development, and you're doing developing for subdivisions, you do you figure that the the home builder like a like a big home builder they're buying tons of lots 20 percent of the value of the finished lot should be in the land is how they look at it now if you are uh dealing with a bunch of lots and in, in, on the street in poinciana or deltona or something it's less than that if you're talking about a lakefront lot uh, it's going to be more than that so for example you might pay three hundred thousand dollars for a lakefront lot and only spend 500 on the house okay so uh, and, and have a you know a nice big house uh jika asked and i'll get back to your question shirley but jika asked how much dollars per square foot for, for new construction um it is going to be more expensive when you're talking about building your own house than doing the traditional uh, production buyers um uh, production builders but you can do any you can spend anywhere from 110 dollars a square foot to as much as you want 350 dollars a square foot whatever it is you want it depends on your finishes Depends on what you want, how fancy you want it, uh, how high you want to build, how uh, your ceilings, your 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 finishes. Obviously, if you want travertine floors and everything, you know, it depends on what you want. So um, you can spend as I promise you, you can spend as much as you want or as little as you want. If the parade of homes type houses are four hundred dollars a square foot, a typical if I just wanted a, a place to live, I could do it for one hundred dollars a foot. Okay. Going back so, to her uh, ski lot, uh, one acre, how big of a sign can she, like if she has a custom wood painted sign, whatever, ski lot, uh, wonderful location, blah, blah, blah. What, what are the sign limitations? Those are, those will be based on the jurisdiction that she's in. So Winter Haven or, or Polk County, somebody might have their own, 
they might have their own restrictions to it. Yeah. Typically, you know, people allow four by fours and stuff like that, four feet by four feet. But she would have to check with um, with Winter Haven or whatever jurisdiction she said. She said it's near Winter Haven, so I assume Polk County. Um, yeah. So Bob, there is no there is no wrong answer. Pardon me, well, Bob. Why do you think the science matters? Well, if you have something special. Uh, are you trying to sell the lot or is this for your own, you want to build your own house on it? Um, I have a two stage I want to do. One is if I just uh, cleaned up, I sell, or one is I build to sell. So it depends. I'm, I'm trying to see what's the best way to do it. Uh, so that's why I'm, I, was, uh, I was trying to see if I can get an appraisal to let me know what's the best way to do that. So uh, if you're, if you're selling to somebody else, uh, it, that's a very nice lot. And I take it it's no 30, $40,000 lot. Something like that would justify a nice sign uh, other than, you know, a small for sale sign. Uh, it, it's just common sense to point out ski lot right on the lake, one acre, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good idea. And I would even have one down by the lake where the skiers can see it as well. So, but I want to talk to you about, about what you have. So the lot, you said getting it cleaned up, is it not, is it over, over wooded? What is it? What kind of condition? It's, is it? it's, it's not much. Uh, yes. Several big piece, uh, big trees is that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. there. So, uh, but that lake is uh, connected to eight lakes. So it's chain lakes. So it's a yeah, it's chain lakes. Okay. Old, you can go everywhere. So um, it's very, uh, it's not a lot of uh, woods. No. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, um, that's another thing. So trees. So. That's another thing to put on your sign is to talk about the, the, the it's on the chain of lakes. So, um, so here's the thing. So lots are illiquid. If you're thinking of illiquid, meaning you can't sell them easily, they take a while to sell typically because there's not that many people out there who can do that. There's a lot more, there are a lot more people who have the, uh, first of all, a lot of times people need to move when they need to move. And so they want to buy a house that's existing. People prefer to buy a house existing than to go through the process of building. Um, you know, people also, they joke about it's a good way to get divorced is to build a house together. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, work that goes into it, a lot of, I, I mean, I'm not looking forward to it. So that's, that's uh, the, the good part about that is when you buy a lot and build, particularly a lot like on a lake, the people who are buying uh, a bunch of lots in Poinciana and building houses, they're making a lot of money doing that. There is built-in value, built-in equity when you build a house, okay? Because you take a two hundred thousand dollar lot and you build a, you spend four hundred thousand on the house, and if something on a lake or something like that, that house is probably going to be worth eight hundred thousand dollars that you spent six hundred thousand building. Okay, it's just that there's a lot of work and stuff that goes into it, and there's some risk involved, right? So, you're talking about maybe building on your lot, if you want to actually sell it and you want to make more money, then you absolutely can build on it. If you have the ability to to pay for building on it, then I would recommend that if you want to make some money on it. If you said, hey, how can I make the most money? That's what I would say. Um, if you just want to sell it as a lot, it, do you have, does it have neighbors on each side? It's a, do you have I, neighbors that's nearby? That's a question I want to ask you because the lot is good is both sides. Is one side is people has a, some wetland that they cannot build on. And then the other side is that is like a church owns. It's just like a square, very small, cannot build on. So your house gonna be in the middle, and then both sides don't have. A, it's like you have like a three acres to you uh, to look at, and but can don't have a neighborhood. So that's uh, I don't know if I can put that in my ads to to uh, is that to. Uh, should not keep. I just wrote. Keep quiet. <laughs> I just wrote the first thing you need to do, which is a wetlands delineation. So look, I wrote it down over here on the on the chat. Wetlands delineation. That's the first study that you need. Okay. Um, 
that study, uh, I've got some companies I can refer you to if you want some environmental, um, environmental assessment companies. So that is uh, a wetlands delineation. Those are some, that is something you need to be, that needs to be done first to see if you even- I had a, uh, you know, uh, kind of survey though. The survey doesn't have uh, wetland. No, this is a wetlands delineation. It's completely different. They're gonna flag your wetlands and they'll mark it on your survey. They'll take your old survey and they'll mark it with the, where the wetlands go. And then the local jurisdiction will have a setback. They'll have rules of setbacks from the wetlands. Usually that's not too negotiable. Usually it's at least 25, 50 feet and it's not too negotiable. Um, but if you need one to build something there, then you can't. You can go for a variation like, or sorry, a variance like Bob was talking about earlier. Mm, is that right. not part of the environmental study though? That what you just said or no? Well, is, is she getting a, it depends on if you get a full environmental study, yeah, they're going to mark the wetlands. But, but a wetlands delineation is much cheaper. They just go out and flag wetlands. Okay. So that's without the, the soil studies and stuff like that. You can at least get a good idea of where the wetlands uh, delineation line is. So they'll do, they'll be able to point out the hundred year flood plain and all that kind of stuff. You should be able to find that on a, on a typical, uh, the county map, but they'll be able to show you what has wetlands and they can tell by the soils that they can tell by just walking on it a lot of times, but they can tell by the soils and stuff like that. So you need an environmental assessment. Which I just put in here as well. Um, Couple of companies that do this, um, just so you guys know, in the Central Florida area, uh, everywhere, everywhere. Um, I know Biotech Consulting um, covers everywhere that is in our footprint: Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville. Um, they cover everywhere. So, um, and uh, Monica Consulting is based out of uh, between Orlando and Tampa. So, anybody needs anything? Those are two companies that I know of. You can choose whomever you like. Ryan? Yes. Hi. Um, I would like to ask, um, so with all of these assessments, uh, who is paying for all this? Would, would we be doing it for the listing agent for these properties or the seller? Oh, we don't. No, the seller. The, no, no, no. The agent doesn't pay for any of this. This is the, this is the seller or okay. the buyer. Um, in, in Shirley's case, because she wants to know how valuable her property is, she doesn't need an appraisal. Um, I, I don't think you do. You can get one if you want, Shirley, but it's, uh, I think that's a waste. Um, but the um, typically, typically it's the buyer because the seller just throws up a lot, and you want to make sure that you know you can build what you want to build. And every buyer will have different ones. But if a seller already has one, that's a bonus. Um, kind of like when a seller already has a survey for you to just recertify, it's a bonus as opposed to having to get in your, you having to pay the full boat for the your own surveyor. But uh -huh. these. Um, uh, in Shirley's case, Shirley would do it just to make sure she what she has. But typically, this is going to be the buyer doing it to make sure they can build what they want to build. Okay. Oh, and also, okay. I have a property, um, well, a listing that might be coming up soon. It's in um, Homo Sasa, and it's about a quarter of an acre, and it's vacant, but there's lots of trees on the property. Um, do I? Are there any specific things I need to do? Any tests or assessments? before listing this property, even though there are houses all around this property? No, you only need to, when you're listing, you're listing it for someone else. The only thing you need to do is disclose if they know of something, okay? okay. Just like a, with a house, you have to disclose anything they know of. If they know they can't build on the property, they know they can only build, if they went to try to build on it and they decided they didn't want to build because of X, Y, or Z, then you have to let, you have to disclose that. Okay. Okay. Um, otherwise, and otherwise you're just wasting your time anyway, but you're also going to cause the buyers to go through this. What, so if you know, look, we can only build a 1200 square foot footprint, um, then, then you have to disclose that. Um, and you should disclose that it's in everybody's best interest. So, uh, but if you don't, if they don't know anything about it, they just have this thing, um, particularly if they have neighbors on both sides, they're probably fine building whatever their neighbors built. Um, yeah. you know, if their neighbors have 1200 square foot houses. I know the, the Homo Sassa area pretty well. And, and I know there's a lot of tiny, uh, you know, what we would consider small houses, but they're little, you know, they're, they're fishing houses and stuff like that. So, or retirement homes for people, for couples. So they're small. 
Now, I, I wouldn't be assumed that I can go build a 2,500 square foot house next to them, right? So, right. but I think you can assume you can build whatever the neighbors built. So, okay. and, um, yeah, sure. Address, address. The address usually, um, how can you get exactly the address? Usually, when you buy the raw land, you only have a uh, street address you don't have a uh, numbers right oh. you don't the, a lot of times you don't have numbers you just vacant lots just get listed as as uh you know i don't know what street yours is on but uh, as jones street vacant land you jones have street. to get a permit for that correct unless you have your plan you have your permit then you get an address uh, for whatever reason, no, it hasn't been plotted. Put zero Go ahead, Maple Bob. Street. You just put zero Maple Street, and the title company can figure out what the street address will be. Well, yeah, because these because these haven't been platted yet uh, for homes, so there is no address. Only the post office can actually assign an address. Right. All right. Um, any other questions on on any of this stuff? Um, I'm sure there are. So let's hear them. Okay. So the what the wetlands delineation and the environmental assessments do they both measure different things, or can the environmental assessments also uh, have wetlands delineation? And when the buyer gets the wetland delineation, they can take that into the county to find out what lot what part of the law is buildable. Can you explain a little bit more about the difference in between both of them and what do they specifically cover? Okay, so environmental assessment is there's phase one, uh, there's different different types of environmental assessment, phase one, phase two. They're gonna check to make sure there's no eagle's nest on the property. They're gonna check all kinds of stuff to make sure that you can build there. Okay, so you're getting environmental assessment. As you go deeper into phase twos and stuff like that, they're gonna do soil borings to make sure but that's more for commercial type stuff. If you're in a neighborhood, you should be perfectly fine. Um, and in fact, no one will ever know, ever be the wiser anyway, because you're building a house there. So, um, so wetland delineation is going to do that. That is a cheap way to flag the wetlands to let you know, I've got a wetlands issue here before you get okay. too far down the road. Okay. All right. Environmental assessments are typically a little more expensive. They are going to be a little more ex expensive. Um, now, just because you have wetlands doesn't mean that you, that's when you want to talk to one of these consulting firms who, who does the mitigation and all that kind of stuff, because a lot, just because it's wetlands doesn't mean it can't be built on or near because they can do, you can do mitigation. And if you don't know what that is, that is replacing that wetlands with another piece of wetland somewhere else that you donated. Okay. That you okay. replaced. All right. Okay. So it's just, it's just money. It's just, it's just replacing the impact that you're making on these wetlands. Okay. So um, that's, uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but environmental assessment is, it takes into, into uh, account different, depending on the phase, it takes into account all the different things that affect your, the environmental stuff. It assesses the entire environment for the environmental impact of what you're going to be doing. What so, are our impact fees for in, I know I'm, I live right on Osceola, Polk County line. Osceola County is like $12,000 impact fee. Polk County is like 8,000. Is that just a money grab or is that to hook up to septic or what does that actually impact fees for? Completely different. So, so a, a, a county that has, um, a, a, let's take, Florida, for example, uh, or a county is good. A county that has, every time someone new moves into a county, every time a new dwelling is made for a county, there, there's a new impact on schools. There's a new impact on the roads. There's a new impact on utilities. Um, there's a new impact on everything. And so the county wants to get paid for that. And so that's how we, as current residents of these counties, um, as everything gets more and more crowded, we need better and better roads. We need better and better school, bigger schools. We need this, we need that. This money helps pay for that. So, I mean, I don't like them, but they're, it's a big, it is a, it's a money grab, but it also, these people are making an impact. Every time the, the, 
every for every new person that lives in a town, that's more police, more fire, more everything that we need. So that's what it is. It's literally the impact that you're you're literally paying for the impact that you're making on the town, on the county. Okay, so uh, or if you're in a city, part of that goes to the city and part goes to the county, whatever ones you're whatever ones you're impacting. Now, if I live in, uh, like you said, you live on the line. If you live in Osceola and you go to the Publix in, in, uh, in Polk and get in a fender bender in the parking lot, then you're using all the Polk County services for your house that's in, uh, you, you paid impact fees in Osceola. So why, Ryan, if I just move to an existing house, I don't have to pay impact fees. So why is it only on new construction? Well, it's only on new construction because if you're moving to an existing house, you're replacing someone who moved out. So you're not really creating an impact per se for there can only be more impact with more housing units. So that's why it's done for new housing units. Everybody understand that? That answer the question? Am I cutting out? Am well, I cutting out? Did anybody no. hear me? No, we can hear you fine. I can hear you. All right, so you guys are all frozen on my screen. Um, okay, so um, any other questions? Hey, Ryan, what about special bonds that may be out there on property? Like uh, the property doesn't have sidewalks, you have to put the sidewalk in that you'd have to pay the county for, or they're building a new um, school down the street. Will that all be in the impact what? report? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all in the impact fees. That's all in the impact fees. So you, that's, yeah. There, there's no, there's no special assessments. It's just impact fees. That is your assessment for for moving in and creating an impact. But that's a little bit different on uh, this, George Lumen, on the fees because in. Um, some areas that if you have, uh, like if you're doing a capital uh, improvement on a school, that'll be on your taxes either in, as a uh, ad valorem or non ad valorem fee and everybody's paying that. So that won't show up in your impact fees, but the, uh, the impact fees, uh, like the difference between uh, Long Highway 27 on Osceola and Polk, uh, it's just, how much government services are you getting? And, uh, and so that is how those fees are assessed. And, uh, and so, so you'll get that, but it, it isn't when the, the example of a new school project, everybody's gonna pay for that new school project. That won't be in the CDD, but you'll see those as line items in the, uh, the taxing if they've got a, a, a bond issue that you're paying off over time, so they'll add you know, a 20 year payoff to your property on that. So you did a penny increase in a mill levy or, or, or percent increase in a mill levy or whatever. Uh, those will show up and it'll show up. Uh, usually it's marked in the tax assessor. So that's a little different than having to build a new road or the impact of having to buy a new teacher or buy uh, new police and fires, Ryan pointed out. Excellent. What are, the what are the steps to get the land ready for utilities, sewer, water, and what is the expected cost? Can you share the steps and companies' names? Wow, Ida. Um, you have, well, lots of people are on here now. Uh, the land ready for utilities, sewer, water. The land, are, are we talking about individual vacant lot for building here? Because that's what we're talking about today. You're getting more into the commercial aspect of development. Um, these vacant lots, land lot should have utility sewer water at the at the uh, property um and the uh you i mean you pay the utilities you pay the the city or whomever for the uh for the right to hook up to their their sewer or whatever it is um i'm going to skip over that that's a that's a commercial question um uh, site developer. Most builders are going to move all the. They're going to move the dirt around on an individual. Again, we're sticking with individual houses to build on here, individual lots to build on. Um, um, okay, uh, Bob's talking about also talking about subdivision stuff. Um, 
Okay, so Edith, if you're talking about a vacant lot to build on, those things should already be on site. If they're not, then they have to pay to run them from the nearest spot. That's another great thing to look at. So now we're talking about something pretty rural, if you're talking about that. And if it's too rural, then they're going to allow, they're probably allow them septic and, and, and well. But if you have to hook up to nearby stuff, you, this is rarely going to be a problem for you. But always find out where your utilities are. Um, a builder, if you don't know how to look for them, you can tell by the, uh, by the setups that are out front, uh, the stubs, what we call them, out front. If you can't tell, ask a builder. Um, even if a builder just comes out to give a quote or whatever, you ask them, say, you know, what do we have out here? And they'll tell you sewer water, uh, and this is power, whatever it is. Or they'll say, it looks like you have, you're going to be on septic here. Okay, so um, yes, builders, builders connect them for the clients, but they don't run them to the property. So if sewer is a quarter mile away, the builder is not going to run it to the property. You're going to have to pay for it. Well, I mean, some builder will, a site work company will, will bury a line out to your property. Uh, but you have to go through the, the city and, or the county or the utility company to get approval for that. All right. Um, any other questions? Oh, Ryan, do you recommend yes, any? Do you recommend any specific builders for the homeless Sasa area, or should I just kind of? No. Yeah, find find some. Just just uh, uh, guys, I hate to say this, but just Google them. Seriously, find find them. Have them come out. Get comfortable. Have the have the person get comfortable with them. If you don't have a, unless your seller, it sounds like you have a, Victoria. It sounds like you have a seller there. Yes. Unless your seller wants to build a spec house, which is a, I don't know if you guys know the spec house. Spec house is just a house built on speculation that someone will buy it. Unless your unless your people want to build a, a spec house, I wouldn't worry about that yet. Okay. But um, if you uh, if you uh, it, just Google them, check out their websites, get to know them, have them come out, meet them, get comfortable with them. Their whole thing is. When you call them out there, they're in sales mode. So they're going to come out there and they're going to put their best foot forward and, and hope to get your business. So yeah. just use your best judgment like you would anything else. Okay. And of course, get their bids and look over their bids. And you will see that a lot of them are just going out there trying to, they're throwing big prices out there trying to uh, trying to get business that way. And uh, I guess it works for them because they, they have houses. And, they, and they'll have a, they'll also have, houses that they can show you pictures and, and houses you can drive by and look at. A lot of them will have houses in process that you can go out and walk around. So um, get that get that information from them as well. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Hey, Ryan. Hi, Can I how are you? Question? Hi, good, how are you? Yeah, so uh, sure. speaking about the home builders, can I just walk to like say Ashton Woods or the, whatever the home they're building and just introduce myself without a buyer or anybody and just ask them about the plans They can show me around? Can they also share like how much commission do they give if I bring a buyer or how does it work? Um, yeah, that was last week's whole training was about that. Absolutely. You should go. You should go see every home builder in town. Okay. And they will talk to you. Don't go during don't go during the busy time, but go, you know, during the week and okay. and talk to the people there at the desk and, and whoever the salespeople are on, on duty are and find out what lots they have available and find out what, you know, what premium lots they have and how much commission they're paying, what incentives they're offering. Absolutely. You should be an absolute okay. expert on that. And go okay. go everywhere and be. Pick an area or pick a side of town or pick whatever you want and go. Maybe it's just luxury homes. You'll only do the Toll Brothers and that kind of thing. And you're going to go and know those properties better than anybody else. Okay. And that's your that's where your value is added, right? Okay. So when you do get someone interested in homes and more and more people, that was the, the crux of the session last week was more and more people are buying new homes because they can't find homes uh, on inventory homes, inventory, right? Yeah. So they're going to buy new homes. And so the best way to serve your client and to make money is to go out and know that market as well and present those options to them up front. Because what we're seeing a lot is people who are showing them houses for a month and they can't get anything. They've made a few offers and then they just stop by. They wander by a, a home builder, uh, Ashton Woods, on the way home from church on Sunday and mm -hmm. buy a house without their, without their realtor. Okay. So present these options, these new home options up front. 
Okay. okay. Talk to them about, listen, we're going to make offers. We're going to look for exactly what you guys want in existing homes. But I also want you to be aware of some of the things that are going on in new construction. And here's this, here's this, here's this. And as these inventory homes prices keep going up and up, of course, so do new builds, but they're more, they're closer than they have been in price for a new home compared to mm -hmm. an existing home. So make sure all, all they know all this stuff is, uh, is, uh, is on the table when you first meet with them and talk about going to look at homes. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, last week should be posted. If it's not, I will, uh, I'll find out why. Um, um, no, uh, Edul, I don't know about clear co cooperation, clear cooperation, no. You know, I, I, I um, it was weird. I was just going through Matrix and I saw it and I kind of um, click on it, but it's it's something new that came out last March, apparently. Click Corporation Matrix, um, Stellar is doing, but they're finding a lot of agents for pre-listing their homes. You know, they're advertising their homes early you know, putting sign in front, you know, for sale coming soon, you know, all that kind of stuff. But if you do that, you have one day to list the property or else they find you. And they find yeah. you. I didn't know that was called clear cooperation. No, yeah. that's, uh, yeah, that's that, uh, that form. And the, the fine is pretty, pretty hefty too. 500, um, 500. But I yeah, see pretty hefty. agents did it. Um, they, they put it on Facebook, which is considered advertising. Signs, mm -hmm. anything that's masked, you know, email, um, that's mass advertising, that's considered mass advertising. You have one day to list the property. If not, they will fine you. Good. So you guys know about the, um, oh, what's it, the MLS waiver and all that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff you have to get signed. Yes. Do that. Yeah, I think okay. that's why you brought that out. Remember that we had to sign that agreement? Yeah. Like, yeah. No, they're, they're serious about it. it. I just bumped into it, I think, a couple of days ago, and I saw it, and I was like, whoa, didn't realize that, because a lot of yeah, people... Yeah, a bunch of, a bunch of you guys, a bunch of you guys asked me, do I have to sign this? And uh, the answer is, if you want to be on MLS, yes. Yeah. Um, so, you guys... Uh, even though it says Dana on his screen, his name is Richard. You guys have seen him on here before, uh, Richard Magnolo. And he is um, he is starting a team down in the Broward, St. Lucie, West Palm Beach, uh, Palm Beach County. And we have joined the board down there. So we're members in Miami, Broward, all the way up the East Coast there. So if you guys uh, need anything down in that area, Richard and his team will be happy to help you. Um, and uh, we are newly newly uh, christened board members in that area as well. So if you guys need to do work down there, uh, Richard would be happy to help you guys. He's a uh, great guy and uh, and running a team down there. So let us know. Dalton has a client who will need to sell a condo there after they buy one here, to buy here. So there you go. Um, all right, guys, any other questions or comments? Uh, Ryan, I have a couple on the uh, assignment of addresses. There's a kind of a catch-22. We just went through this a vacant lot we did in Longwood. And uh, Seminole County EMS actually assigns the addresses uh, and sets the signage, uh, the size of the lettering. Uh, and then they tell the post office what they assign. Uh, so, the so somebody said the post office does it. The post office is involved, but they don't, they're not the driver, at least in Seminole County. And the um, thing that we did was we were putting water and sewer in because they were adding it to the street. Uh, they were upgrading the water and they were adding sewers to get rid of septics. So to make the lot more valuable, we went ahead and put that in. And that created a catch 22 because normally you get the address when you start to get a building permit. Uh, sometime during the building process, they will give you the address. But we couldn't get hooked up to the water without an address. So we had to go back to Seminole County and say, hey, you guys got us in a catch 22 and it only cost us $25 to make that go away. 
And uh, so, so there was one issue. And then I've got uh, the unicorn I've been looking for. Uh, I've got a house up in Citrus County now. They put solar, and you guys know I've been studying solar for quite some time. Um, they put solar on an old roof. And the company that put the solar in has a 30 year warranty, put it in a year ago, and the warranty is non transferable. And to take that solar panels off to re roof, it's 2,500 bucks uh, to take them off and reset them. So I'll be adding to my PowerPoints a few other lessons learned here. Uh, people are doing these solar co ops and not, and the construction companies are weaseling out of the 30 year deals. Uh, so I'm hoping to find out more on it this afternoon. Uh, so as you sell with solar, keep in mind, there's a lot of questions you gotta ask because your buyer's gonna pick up a lot of liability if you've got a bad roof and a, a uh, new solar system. So there's a couple of lessons learned there. Yeah, that is a that's a that is a good point. I never really considered that. And people out there selling solar to everyone, whether they need a new roof or not. So, thank you, George. Um, yeah, the lot I bought was already in. So the other alternative is I already know my address on my vacant lot because it is platted in a part of the subdivision. So when you're not dealing with a subdivision, um, like it was listed in the MLS, it's listed on the property appraisal list. Everybody with an address. So I have an address already. Um, and, but yes, you're right. When you don't have that, you see a lot of zero, you know, zero Smith Street, zero this and that, um, or just blank. It'll just say Smith Street vacant. Um, so uh, when you're searching, don't be surprised to see that. Um, any other questions? Hello? Yes. Yes, we have a question. I have a buyer who is interested in Opportunity Zone. And uh, do you know what's the best way to find Opportunity Zone in Orlando? Anybody have an answer for that? I don't. What do you mean by Opportunity Zone? Yes, there is land that, has, uh, that are uh, located in Opportunity Zone, which uh, I think the tax, they, they pay less taxes for that. Yes, uh, this George Lumen, having done some of this work, there's an economic development person within the building department or the mayor's department somewhere. Uh, but there will be somebody in Orange County, uh, or Orlando and Orange County and each city in, they will have somebody that's assigned in, I think, in Sanford, it's called a special projects manager. Uh, but the, there will be an economic uh, development person in there that wants these brownfield areas filled in. Um, so if they're looking in Orlando, they're probably in a whole office for it. And in Sanford, there's one person working it. And uh, so you're looking for the person who is uh, the person or, uh, or department, depending on and Orlando probably has an entire department that is tasked with doing these economic uh, development zones. And a, a lot of that's built around brownfield development. So, um, so areas that they want to, that have been blighted and they want to get built out. Uh, and, 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 and there are quite a few incentives, uh, no or lower taxes for some periods of time. Uh, there's federal grants available. There are all kinds of incentives that people will have to get these areas uh, rezoned. And it's, if there's no environmental impact, you're not going on you know, an old radium site or something like that. Uh, you can, you know, th there's a need to build, especially multifamily homes. Uh, right now, that seems to be the biggest thing. So you may, they, the incentives also may be there that if you do some kind of co-op for, uh, for low income, even if you're a luxury high rise, if you've set aside two apartments for uh, low income or rent managed or, or, or payment managed areas, you'll get those incentives as well. So there are a lot of incentives out there. There always are. Uh, and so you just find the economic development person and 
say, where are your opportunity zones? They will have them mapped out. They will also know the grants. If you don't know where to start, start with the mayor's office because they're always looking for, for projects like this because they make good public images for the mayor's office. Yeah, I, you, I linked a, uh, I put a link to Orlando's there in the chat. Um, so uh, research that and see there, they've got maps, they've got all kinds of stuff there just for Orlando. I'm sure all the other areas are, are pretty similar. Any other questions or comments? All right, guys. Well, um, this one will be up on the uh, on YouTube in the next couple of days, and uh, we'll have something exciting for you again next week. Uh, we did get some uh, questions about having a builder on. We'll consider that probably not next week, but um, we'll consider that. Uh, we'll have a lender coming up again soon. And um, anybody else you guys are interested in hearing from? Any ideas? All right. Well, I'll see you guys soon. Enjoy your week and uh, let me know if you need anything. Bye, guys. <laughs>